I will talk about our experiences in PPP which is LNT's experiences in PPP. Uh, over the past 25 years, we have been in this for almost since 1995 and it, it has had a very checkered uh, you know uh, interest. It was uh, very hot in terms of lot of interest, lot of commitment between 1995 and 2000. Uh, it went through a very uh, difficult phase in 2000 to 2004, but the good part is PPP in the country was equal to LNT plus Island FS plus maybe a company or so, that is about it, only about three players, three or four players. 2004 to 2012 were very exciting times, very, very exciting times. Investments worth at least about 6, 7 lakh crores were uh, poured into the private uh, format into infrastructure which included of course power, it included roads, it included ports, it included airport, included water supply and all the infrastructure around the IT boom which is IT buildings build, uh, uh, you know built to suit and the other social infrastructure that went with it apart from commercial. Metros, uh, metros came up on private sector format at least Mumbai, Delhi and uh, Hyderabad. Hyderabad was LNT, Mumbai was Reliance and Delhi was Reliance which went Ori and, and, and got terminated. So if you really see uh, between 2004 to 2012, it was really a boom. 2012 onwards, it has been a huge challenge for various reasons which we will see. So uh, frankly speaking, we will look at uh, investment objectives, project processes, value drivers and experiences. Now this is a huge. Uh, body of uh, uh, of discussions which is around it. I will try and keep it as as precise and simple as possible uh, for another hour and a quarter. It is 3.15 or 3.30? 3.15, okay. So that is about an hour then and uh, please feel free to just stop me wherever things are not very clear and then I will try and explain it to you, okay. So what are the objectives? Before you get into any, any PPP project, your objectives have to be very clear, right? And the objectives which, which, uh, uh, which, which go behind any investment, what is the, what should be the objective behind any investment? Sorry? To create value, good, three English words, to create value. But can we quantify it? I mean, you are all engineers, so you believe in quantification, right? Profit, cost. You make an investment, what do you expect? Returns, right? And how much return do you expect? Let, let us do a quick roll call. You are a person with a lot of funds at your disposal. What is the return that you expect if you invest in infrastructure? 20. Good, good start. Okay, what next? Anyone else wants to volunteer? Don't see the presentation, no, please. This is the disadvantage of presentations. Yeah, anyone else? Fifteen to thirty. Okay. What returns? Sorry. 15. So, someone said create value, okay. So, what is very logical? If you have to create value, do you need a higher return or a lower return? To create value, do you need a higher return or a lower return? Lower return. How do you create value in lower returns? No, so let us just focus on returns. Now, when you say returns, what does it mean? In the first year, you get 1.15 or let us say 1.10 to be make it simple. In the second year, you get 1.21. In the third year, you get uh, 1.35. It is it's cumulative, right? That is what return is all about. So, if you put 15, it will be much higher. If you put 20, it will be much higher. So, if you put 100 rupees into an infrastructure project, it becomes 120, 140. 
but tell me one thing do you get returns in that way in any business it starts off slow right it starts off maybe in the negative territory and then moves on it starts off somewhere here if returns are here and the x is the time and y is the percentage then it starts off somewhere here and then it it it, it moves like this this is how returns come and then it plateaus off when it reaches when the project reaches capacity correct when you say return in infrastructure project or for that matter any business it is the cash flows are rising out of this profile where you invest 100 and you get back 500 600 800 whatever it is in simple terms i have kept it very very simple right now we come to the other aspect that some gentleman mentioned that low return now where wear your shoes on the other foot which is um, you are the public right and you are paying toll or you are paying the user development fee in the airport or you are paying a, a, a usage charge in a port what would you like to pay the lowest or free free then nothing will get built like in this country there is nothing free you either pay through taxes or you pay through as as you use pay as per you use or a combination of both that is the entire infrastructure story there is no other story there is no big story either you pay through taxes or you pay per use or a combination of both depending on the type of infrastructure if it's something which socially affects a lot of people it tends to be low or free if it if it is if it can you you take a car you drive down to bangalore you can afford a car you want a good road you pay for it every time every 50 kilometers you you pay right so <clears throat> the lower the toll the more happy you are correct now isn't it a contradiction of sorts the guy who has invested wants a higher return the guy who uses it wants to pay less right so there has to be some process by which an equilibrium of sorts is created how do you create that equilibrium particularly in public funded projects or or sorry in 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 private sector investment formats where profit maximization return maximization is the core of investment whereas the usage is by the general public right and consequently what happens is there is competition you create competition he wants to invest you want to invest you want to invest i am the government i am responsible to give the utility all three of you want to invest right so what should be my criteria for choosing one of you and giving a concession for 25 years to build own operate and then after 30 years transfer it right so what should be my criteria as the government so you got the third player so you have uh, you had uh, private sector which wanted the highest return you had public which wants to pay very little you have the government which says all right how do i now make sure that all these three objectives are met i make them compete if i make them compete then the guy who quotes the lowest rate of return should technically get the project because on the other side of the coin of a lower rate of return is a lower fee so you see you have to create competition you have to create that market once you create that market a person with the lowest expectations of return will come in hopefully it should also then create a lower charge of course there are various mechanisms to arrive at it but i'm just giving a very simple example that whenever there is a private sector participation there has to be competition to make sure that you meet the objectives of a lower return it's not the objective sorry the most optimum level is reached in terms of return and the delivery of service correct so that's what private sector investment is all about as we get into the complexities of private sector participation in infrastructure we'll try and understand this a little better 
So, very clearly there is a valuation issue. Someone said create value, right? What it means is you get a valuation and that valuation is nothing but we studied the profile of the cash flow after paying all the expenses, after paying interest on the loan that you take, after repaying the loan there is some cash available. You take that cash and you discount it at any point of time, you will get a value. So, that value arising out of the free cash flows to equity FCFE based on the hurdle rate. The hurdle rate is nothing but the rates that all of you said. Someone said you want 20 percent, someone said you want 30 percent, someone said 15 percent. So, they said look, okay, look, if I have to earn 15 percent and I invest a, a hundred units, could it be rupees, dollars, whatever and that hundred has to become x which will deliver me a 15 percent return that x is the value. It is a valuation right and this valuation is after paying off interest, paying off expenses, paying off the loans, whatever little money that is available which expands as the project ages is the valuation. Return objectives we have discussed. Technically, returns and risks are they correlated? So, if you have a higher risk, would you expect a higher return? Yes, if you have a lower risk, you expect a lower return, right? If someone were to tell you that, look, please invest in this project X, it is a water supply project. Here is a source of water, but uh, your job is to create the intake well, install the pump set, bulk transfer the water by drawing it from the intake, store it here. Here is the lake or the pond or whatever it is, this is yours. From there, distribute it to the municipality or the corporation or create your own reservoir, create your own tanks, and I will pay you X number of units every month. Your job is to build the intake well, build the storage, create the network and supply water to this city or town or factory or power plant or steel plant or whatever, right? And I will pay you an X amount of money every month. Is there any risk over here? Lower. As compared to here is a road, it is a two lane road, expand it to four lanes, depending on traffic you collect your money. You do not get any fixed money, traffic comes, you get money, traffic does not come, you do not get anything. So, which is a higher risk, the road or the water supply? Road. So, consequently your return expectations are going to be higher and here your return expectations are going to be lower. So, that is that's, that's what it means by, by when I say a revenue risk, where there is a revenue risk, the returns are higher, where there is a non-revenue risk, the returns are lower. Now, there is another element that we need to discuss and that element is, uh, <clears throat> how do you calculate what should be your return? You gave some numbers based on some, you know, some thought, right? What should be your, how do you calculate what should be your return? What are the sources of funding? So, there is, you see, when you have to calculate what should be your return, you have to get into what is the cost of capital. Where does capital come from? Debt and equity, correct. So, you have done this earlier, right? I do not want to be wasting your time if you have done this earlier. So, there is a cost of debt and there is a cost of equity. Obviously, when we spoke about returns, what returns did we speak about? Equity or debt? When we said 18, 20, 25, 15, was it equity or debt? Equity, correct. So, there is, you have studied the concept of weighted average cost of capital, you have studied that. So, I will not get into that. So, frankly speaking, you did the, the revenue risk related projects. 18 to 22 percent, non-revenue risk 12 to 16 percent. Would you hold on to a project for eternity till, till it exhausts its lifespan or would you like to 
you have to decide how many years you want to hold a project, right? You want to hold it till maturity or you want to hold it till you reach a particular IRR and then you, you get rid of the project or you sell it, get rid meaning sell it, right? You sell the project, uh, realize the value and then move on. So when you are constructing the portfolio, all these aspects become very important. You will have some non-revenue risk related project, you will have some which are revenue risk related project and some which are very strategic. An airport project is very strategic, a port project is very strategic. It can keep scaling up depending on the runway capacity and all other capacity constraints, but it is it's far more strategic than a road because it, it tends to move towards monopoly, right? You, you can't, you land in Bangalore or in Chennai, there is only one airport. You do not have a choice to go to X airport or Y airport or Z airport, unlike a road where you can take any road and go. Point A to point B, you may have two, three alternatives. You do not have such alternatives in an airport, you do not have such alternatives as far as a port is concerned. So, it is more strategic. So, consequently, the valuation of strategic projects are the highest. The valuation of BOT projects come next and the valuation of annuity projects which are non-revenue risk related are the least and they are nothing but the Phillips side of the coin, your returns are also calibrated accordingly. In a strategic project, either you succeed or you fail, right, but the returns, if you succeed the returns are supposed to be very good. Similarly. You know, in a road project, if you succeed, the returns are tending to be very high. However, because of competition, you might choose to compete very aggressively, get into a low return situation because you want the project and then the project does not do well and then you are in a situation what island FS is in a manner of sorts plus a number of other reasons, right. So, at the end of the day, your investment objectives have to be very clear. What is the valuation that you are seeking, which is nothing but the other side of what are the returns that you are seeking? How long do you want to hold the investment and have a portfolio approach? When you grow up and you make tons of money, your savings are also going to be, unless you already have the money, okay, your savings are also going to be along these three or four, uh, you know, percentages. There will be some savings in debt, which is a fixed constant yield that you will get. There will be some savings in equity, where you get much higher returns, but the risks are also high, fluctuating with the fortunes of the stock market. And there will be some savings where, you know, the returns will start multiplying. For example, real estate. Okay, you, you purchase real estate and that is very strategic provided of course, it is in the right location, you bought it at the right time, all those, all those other uh, variables are there, but that is very strategic. So, your whole investment, your own personal investments are going to be guided by pretty much the same, uh, same principle. So, when you are young, you can take more risks. So, your investments will mostly be geared towards equity. As you get older, you will pull out of equity and start putting it into debt because you are more interested in getting constant risk free returns provided you have mutual funds who invest in AAA rated securities, AAA rated companies and here when you are building a portfolio for a private sector investor, let us say a large infrastructure fund or a large family fund and you are investing their money in infrastructure assets then also you will build the same logic. You will have some in non-revenue risk related projects, some in revenue risk related projects and some strategic assets. Is the concept clear? So, the investment objectives are extremely important when you start looking at private sector investment in infrastructure. In India, it did not quite happen that way because what happened was there was a plethora of opportunities and a whole lot of people rushed in. They all thought that they will make a lot of money. In, in the right and the wrong ways, I must admit, right? 
and consequently the sector has almost collapsed and now they are looking at various ways to revive the sector and there are various challenges that are there in reviving that sector. So, I will skip the first three ok, uh, shareholder value creation we discussed. There is a whole lot of stuff around ethical bidding. Uh, when you are when you are planning to make an investment obviously, there is a certain amount there is a lot of competitive uh, competitiveness that comes in. So, how do you make sure that you remain above the board in terms of ethical bidding and that is where you know uh, certain countries like ours have a, 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 a little bit of a distance to carry when all our bidding comes right above board and this is across infrastructure. Uh, unlike uh, other other sectors in infrastructure it is you have to strive very hard on both sides a to ensure that the right practices are followed for bidding and b the responders that is people like us who compete also have a high standard of ethics when it comes to bidding which means no fixing, which means no gold plating, which means uh, you know uh, bidding now and then claiming a lot of money later and then getting it tied into all kinds of litigation and so on and so forth. There are 150 ways in which you can beat the system if you decide not to be ethical. So, you have to decide ki bhai, are you going to be an ethical player or you are not going to be an ethical player very clearly because there are opportunities that you may have to let go because of problems around ethics. Third is of course, responsible asset quality. Now, all of you are engineers. Uh, there is something called good industry practice which is there in all contracts whether you are going to build assets by cutting corners or you are going to build assets properly right. And uh, each one of these topics can be discussed at length, but I am just putting those bullets here responsive O and M. Since uh, in the private sector you own the asset for that period. So, you are responsible to make sure that the service quality does not deteriorate and therefore, a very responsive O and M which is, is what and there are there are there are there is a lot of technology behind O and M. There is a lot of uh, <coughs> Six Sigma practices around O and M. So, O and M by itself is a is a field for each sector whether it is power, whether it is roads, whether it is uh, water supply, whether it is ports, whether it is airport and you have whole lot of studies that are constantly being done to improve efficiencies and to bring down the cost. And then you have employee competency development which is fine. So, we get into project processes which is the crux of building an organization or sustaining an organization which is involved in this whole business of infrastructure building. A while ago, uh, we discussed the, uh, the concept of conflicting objectives right. Uh, the guy who makes the investment obviously, he needs to get a high return and he wants to make the maximum profits. The government is responsible for de delivering the asset because it is the public at large which uses the asset and consequently, the costs have to be low and the only way you can get all this to happen is through competition right, ethical competition. Now, any, any contract in the infrastructure space, any contract follows the normal process of a DPR which is the detailed project report which makes the business case for why this asset is needed, why are you building a metro, why are you building a road, why are you building a port, why are you building an airport. It requires a business case to be established ok. The second arising out of that will be the specs and the scope gets decided, it results in putting out two processes, one is the RFQ and the other is the RFP. The RFQ process is to ensure that you get a responsible bidder to come and bid for the asset or to come and uh, build the asset for you. The RFP is when he actually puts in the bid itself right. And as we discussed the bid should be at a point where the ultimate delivery of the asset is at the lowest possible cost 
provided it complies with the scope and it complies with the specs. So, you have the RFQ request for qualification and the request for proposal. RFQ is to ensure that you get quality bidders, bidders with certain experience. RFP is to ensure that the bidder complies with all the specs and the scope that is there. And then you build the asset, the asset gets built and then you operate and maintain the asset. So, whether it is public funded or whether it is the private sector, the format is the same. You want to build an asset, you have to follow this process, very simple. But there are several nuances when you get into every single step. So, <coughs> bid, bidding strategy, return criteria and the valuation are extremely important again. So, when you are looking at a proposal to be given to the government, when you are looking at a tender, you are reading every single line as to how you are going to bid, what are the strategy that you are going to adopt, how do you do the pricing, how do you do the costing, how do you do the calculation, what kind of structuring you do, etc. There are a whole lot of variables that you need to decide before you put in a bid. Risk assessment and monitoring, which is any large asset has a number of risks during construction phase, right. Forget about the risks that come during the revenue phase. I am talking about during construction or during the project implementation process, there are a number of risks. You must be studying risks, right. So, Every time you look at risk, you look at mitigate, you look at mitigation and therefore you look at cost and that has an impact on the return. So, you have a dynamic uh, model which ensures that you study all the risks, you look at the mitigating costs, but can you eliminate all the risks? For example, uh, let us say you, are, you have a risk of, let us take the biggest example going on now, oil. Suppose you had bid for this project let us say a year and a half ago and the project is now under implementation. Would you have expected oil prices to be going from 30, 35 dollars a barrel to 80 dollars a barrel? I doubt, no, not a single uh, project manager would have estimated oil to go up like that, right. Uh, so, which is why you know the kind of return, now, now suppose it is a uh, it is a project where you know oil constitutes 20, 25 percent of your of your project cost, normally it will be about 8 to 10 percent, let us say 10 percent and oil has doubled, right. So, if a project cost is a thousand, so 100 has become 200. So, you have straight away a 10 percent cost overrun. The moment you get a 10 percent cost overrun, your returns come down by, correspondingly your returns come down, your valuation comes down. So, how do we ensure that all the risks are, you have done the risk mapping exercise, all the risks during project phase, but have you done the risks during operations phase in a PPP project? Revenues, you have done the, the way the revenue curve goes up or down. So, the point is that you know, uh, these risk assessments are extremely important at the bidding stage itself. Because depending on the way you can control the risks, you are going to pitch your returns. The higher the risk, obviously your returns are going to be higher and so on. So, how many of you have actually participated in a bid? If there is a mock bidding exercise and the tender documents are available to let us say three groups, right? and you have to give one number as a bid number. Let us say you have to give project cost as a bid number, right. So, have you done that mock exercise in terms of, of participating in a bid? I think it would be really useful to understand the dynamics of risks, returns when you do that mock exercise of a bid because then you will know, you will start compromising on certain criteria to win the project. And the entire dynamics of what has happened in the country, banks started competing to lend to projects because their profitability depends on the more they lend. Entrepreneurs started participating in, 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 uh, in, in projects because they wanted a higher valuation. Consequently, 
a combination of the, these two was such a heady cocktail that you had project failures. And uh, these project failures are what resulted in NPAs. And the whole discussion around NPAs is because of a failed a bidding or a failed restructuring process. There are solutions to it, but the fact is that from both points of view, risk assessment and monitoring is important, revenue determination, capital cost estimating and contracting. Have you, uh, uh, you know, when you estimate a capital cost, what are some of the facts, uh, what are some of the points that you will take into account? Some points? Sorry? Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start writing down the constituents of a capital cost. Normally, it is known as the total project costs. Okay. In a total project cost, how does interest come? Interest does play a role. But how do you calculate interest? That is the rate. That is the rate. But how do you apply it? Fine. So, you take a loan, right? I assume that you have justified the project, the bankers are happy, they are willing to give you loan, uh, debt equity is 70, 30. So, if it is a 1000, you are taken 700 of debt. And then let us say you negotiate the rate of interest and the rate of interest is 11. So, how do you, how does interest affect project cost? Anyone? <coughs> no, we are talking about total project cost, ok. So, You heard of the S curve, right? Everyone knows what an S curve is. So, your drawal of debt, you draw the debt as you build the project, right? And every month you have to pay interest. So, if 700 is your 700, let us say, is the debt component, and that 700 you will start drawing 10, 20, 30. The bank will the bank give you money if the project does not progress? It will not. So, you draw 10, you draw 20, you draw 30, you draw 40 and like that cumulatively you will reach 700. And that cumulative, that pattern of drawal cumulatively will reflect an S curve, right? Nothing but a total project cost curve, but only as, as far as debt is concerned. So, the interest that, that is calculated on an average if it is 0 over here and let us say it takes 2 years to build the asset and 700 is here and this is the second year, the average utilization, average utilization will be about 350, correct? 2 years, 0 to 700, average utilization will be 350, simplistically speaking. And if 11 percent is the interest rate, right, 5, 5, 38, 38.5 multiplied by 2 years. So, 767 crores, that is the interest cost component. So, you have interest, which is why it is called interest during construction and that is 67 crores. This is assuming, assuming that you have followed the project schedule the way you had envisaged, which is a perfect S curve, right. What happens if if your project shifts, let us say there is a delay of 6 months on the project, what happens to this perfect assumption it goes haywire. So, you instead of having 67 crores as your interest during construction, it can be 75, it can be 80 and would the bank fund this? Bank will not fund it. They will say you put in your own money. You delayed the project, put in your own money to complete it. And if you put in more money than what you had envisaged in the beginning, 
what happens to returns? Returns fall. So, at the end of the day, capital cost estimating and contracting, interest is one component, but the big component here, interest as a component, generally speaking, for a project which takes two and a half to three years, generally speaking, interest during construction is about 10 to 12 percent, 10 to 12, 13 percent of the project cost. The big element, of course, is the construction cost, right, the EPC the engineering, the procurement and the construction, which will be normally say about of 700, it will be around 650, right. Sorry, we said a thousand, right, thousand, so it will be around at least 800. So, the three broad headings of any project are A, construction, which is the EPC, B, interest during construction and C, pre-operative expenses. What are pre-operative expenses? Any guesses? No, we are still at the project stage. I am just talking about capital cost estimation and contracting. I am still trying to get a grip on what is my total project cost. We discussed interest, we discussed construction, which is all engineering procurement construction. Since you took the example of a metro, it includes the civil works, the coaches, the signaling, the automation, the tracks, the traction, the station buildings, the electrical and mechanical stuff around the station buildings, the whole works that is construction cost, right, which is about say 800 in a, in a, in a unit of 1000, you say 1000 crores, 1000 dollars, whatever it is, 1000, 1000, whatever it is, right, 80, 70 percent debt, we calculated the interest, we took the construction cost, now we are at pre-operative expenses. Sure, sure, it is part of it, I agree, so commissioning. Commissioning expenses, let me call it commissioning expenses. Sorry? Bribes, no one finances bribes. See, we all, we all started by saying ethical bidding, where are you? Hello? The reason why I brought in the concept of ethics is only because in infrastructure, you have to decide what kind of a player you want to be. And if you start off by saying, look, I am going to inc include bribes as part of project cost, forget it. I mean, it is not going to fly, very dangerous, right. So, let us come back. So, here are some of the heads of pre-operative costs. First of all, project management, right. You will need project managers, uh, you will need uh, a staff, project management staff, the entire works, the office setup, the site setup, right. You will need consultants, you will need engineering consultants, you will need uh, someone to ensure that safety is properly done, you need an independent engineer to make sure that you are doing what is required in the document and you are not cutting corners, so independent engineers expenses. So, site office expenses, corporate office expenses, project management staff to look at quality, cost and schedule. Uh, independent engineer expenses, uh, consultant fees if any, all that stuff that goes in before even you start earning a penny on the project, all the expenditure which is non-construction related and not interest is pre-operative expenses. Normally pre-operative expenses are in the range of 5, 7, 8 percent depending on the length of the project. The longer it takes to complete a project, the higher the expenditure, correct? Which is why I thought we should spend a little time in understanding what is capital cost and how do you ensure that it is kept under control. Of course, the single most deciding factor on controlling capital costs is what? One, just one primary factor which controls capital costs. Sorry? Absolutely right. 
project duration. You control time, you control cost, provided you don't sacrifice quality and safety. Okay. So, this whole business of estimating capital costs, keeping in mind these three large elements is the crux of your efficiency in capital cost estimation and it plays a huge role in, in ensuring that, that one part of your risk on the entire project is taken care. What kind of contracts are you familiar with? What types of contracts are you familiar with? Lump sum turnkey contracts, LSTK, EPC, item rate, item rate, right? So, you have to decide at this point of time what is the contracting mechanism that you are going to have. Tell me what would determine which kind of contract you get into. Suppose you want to go on an item rate contract, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages? Sorry? It will remain with you. True, very true, but then more uh, also importantly, you have to be familiar with the BOQ, correct? If you are not familiar with the BOQ and you walked into the project and you want to do an item rate, you have a big problem. Not only that, you need a large project management setup because you need to ensure that all the items are being done the way they should be done, you are tracking it, your entire project management setup will be different. Whereas in an EPC, who carries the price risk? Price risk is moved to the contractor, but there you have to be dead sure that your RFQ process is efficient. RFQ is you are qualifying someone to quote, right? If you get all kinds of guys quoting, you are finished with your project, your duration is gone. Because one thing is very clear, you can't change contractors midstream very easily. A, it is highly litigious, meaning there is going to be a lot of claims, counterclaims, etc. And B, uh, you lose time. So, your RFQ process is, is, is so important that you choose the right kind of people to do the right kind of job. And if companies like LNT have, have grown in the past 18, 20 years, uh, just to give you some numbers, when I joined the turnover was hardly 2500 crores of the entire construction division. Today the construction division does about 70,000 crores. So, it has grown 35 times in 16, 17 years. The reason being only one and that is because demonstrating the capability to do complex projects again and again and again on a turnkey basis. No item rate contractor can grow like this. Of demonstrating growth of uh, CAGR of 18, 20, 25 percent in some years is, is phenomenal. So, the point is the kind of contracting that you are going to use is clear, O and M is fine, sensitivity is ok, I think all of you know it, so I do not want to get into that. To determine revenue on a project is, is one of the key uh, aspects of ascertaining viability, right. So, based on our experience, I have just put down some of the, some of the uh, uh, learnings that we have had on forecasting, right. Uh, all of you would have been studied a lot of advanced mathematics, right. In your subjects, you would have done a lot of mathematics. Can revenue forecasts be linear in nature? They cannot be, but unfortunately financial projections, financial projections have to be linear, is not it? With some growth built in, when you go with an application to the bank, years, revenue in in let us say rupees crores. How would the revenue curve look like? And let us say this is the project construction phase minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 
and the project is commissioned here. How would the revenue curve look like? And this is years 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Can someone come here and plot the revenue curve? Plot a straight line based on a projection that you make at the beginning of the project based on which you go to the bank with an application saying please give me money 700 as we discussed. The bank is going to look at that and see whether how is your revenue is looking like because from the revenue you deduct the cost you deduct the interest and that is the money left to pay back the bank right. So, he is going to plot uh, cash flow based on that, but the beginning of cash flow is revenues. So, anyone anyone uh, would like to come and plot the revenue curve as a projection as a projection anyone would like to plot would you just come up and plot the revenue curve as a projection no problem please come up come come just plot it as a projection right you are going to the bank and you are going to tell them that look this is the money that I am going to earn. So, how would you explain to the bank? Would you like to be the banker? Come. He is trying to explain the revenue curve to you. Come, please come. So, you are the banker, right? And you are going to explain the revenue curve to him. This is projection, huh? you have not even started the project. You have gone to him with a loan application. So, what are you going to say? Let us say it moves in terms of 100 ok or 50. You have let us say 50 crores here, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300, 350, 400 right and these are the years. So, now you are going to tell him look this is what I plan to earn in this project and uh, yearly revenue I'm, I just want to get a sense of how you are going to explain the banker. You have commissioned the project in this year. So, you are going to build you are going to build it minus 3, minus 2, minus 1. These are your revenue earning years, right? Year 1, yeah, year 1. Okay. Let us say year 0, yeah, year 0, 0 to 1. Okay, you tell him. Okay. And then? Perfect, okay. Okay. Terrific. Terrific. You are right. You are happy with this? You are happy with it. All right. Now, please sit down. So, con conceptually, what you guys have done is correct, right? Tell me why does it become a constant thereafter? Why do you think it became a constant? No, no, we are only on revenues. We have not come to costs at all. Revenues means what you earn. I am not talking about net gross, it reaches its capacity excellent. So, normally a revenue curve would look like this Maybe you know it is so this is still a projection no? you have not even started the project the project will be minus 3, but in reality it never happens that way. Normally revenue will have two components there is a volume component and there is a tariff component correct. So, let us take the example of a road. In a road how do you estimate capacity? As far as vehicles are concerned you express it in PCU terms passenger car units it is called right. So, even a truck is equal to depending on the number of axles it is equal to x number of passenger car units multi axle, three axle, two axle etcetera. So, the capacity of a road is estimated based on passenger car units, but you hit the capacity on year 1? No, you hit it in year 10, year 12, year 14 depending on what does traffic depend on? Depends on growth, it depends on hinterland, it depends on competing roads, it depends on and, and we discovered to our uh, surprise not so pleasant that it also depends on technology. Do you see two axle trucks on highways anymore? You do not. 
Do you see even three axle trucks on major highways? You do not, you only see multi axle trucks, why? Because it makes sense for that, for a guy who owns a trucking company. But if I have made my projections based on increase in two axle trucks, I am dead because it will never, it will never get realized. If I had three, three, three two axle trucks replacing, replaced by one multi axle truck, I do not get a revenue differential which is multiplied by three. It does not happen that way. So, revenue depends on traffic, revenue also depends on tariff. As per the agreement, I am allowed to increase my tariff by what is known as WPI, wholesale price index. Can anyone predict wholesale price index? Can you predict the inflation in the second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year? What is the average inflation that has, that is, that is there, that has been there in your uh, lifetime that you know since you started reading? 4%? You know, we have lived and projected inflation of 7, 8%. We have lived in those times when inflation was 7, 8 percent and we thought it can never come down and it came down to 4 percent, it came down to 0. So, your revenue curve which is a function of traffic multiplied by tariff in reality will actually be somewhere like this. Sometimes you get a pleasant surprise, sometimes you do not. Right? And having been in this business now for 15 years, if capital cost determination is one pillar for project viability and project valuation, revenue forecasts is the other pillar. And all these points that I have mentioned, there are no linear lines. A best fit regression analysis is possibly one way to mitigate the risk of fluctuating revenues. Historical data interpretation extremely important which means collect as much data as you can and figure out what intelligent stuff you can get out of that data, macroeconomic inputs, technology changes, experiences of projects complete, completed of similar size and similar situation, possibility of competing and alternate facilities, volume growth determination, tariff growth determinants and baseline projections. So, uh, I think all of you have done project management where you do that you know A plus X B plus Y C divided by 6 should be your best fit. The standard very thumb rule stuff, maybe you need to do something similar for revenues. You come up with different curves, different you know trajectories and then you take the average and say this is going to be my revenue. Now, as a banker my dear sir, if you have not employed all this and you have not forced your borrower to employ all these techniques, your money is down the drain because he will project a very, very optimistic revenue curve. He will not be able to realize it. Consequently, he cannot pay the money back to you and you become an NPA. So, <clears throat> revenue determination extremely important. Capital cost extremely important. Type of contracting extremely important. I am just, I am just giving you the fundamentals of how do you put together a project and if there is a bidding environment and if there is a bidding environment, you are also competing against each other. So, please understand the dynamics. They want to win the project, these people want to win the project, you want to win the project. Now, which levers will you use? Will you use the capital cost lever where you optimize the capital cost, optimize the schedule, bring down the cost? whether you will use the revenue lever that your view on revenues is more optimistic than someone else's. Will you use the schedule lever that they estimate they will complete in 36 months, these guys estimate they will complete in 32, you say I will finish it in 30. What happens if you finish it in 30? Any guesses? What happens if you finish it in 30 months instead of 36 months? Sorry? No, no, there is no one. This is your project. Who is going to give you an incentive? No one. No one will give you an incentive. There is an incentive, I agree, but no one will give it to you. But what is that incentive? Sorry? 
more revenue for 6 months excellent that is the highest incentive right what next you are right absolutely right bang on highest lowering the interest cost during construction. So, two big advantages one 6 months of advanced revenues, 2 lower interest cost during construction and then you have another one. Any guesses? Your escalation which you had budgeted, you will have a lower degree of escalation built into the project cost than earlier. Okay? So, it in a competitive environment all these factors start playing a role, but what happens if you win the project with very aggressive capital cost assumptions and then do not realize it. In reality it drifts, your valuation suffers, correct. So, again for capital cost estimates you have got site investigation, front availability, BOQ pricing, commodity trend, schedule estimates, technology trade off and optimizing schedules and capital expenses. I have just put some bullets, there is a lot of science between each one of those bullets in, in practice. In practice there is a lot of science between every single bullet that is there and all that goes into your capital cost estimation. Now, you can imagine if one is bidding for an airport the complexities involved or one is bidding for a port or one is bidding for a metro, the complexities involved in putting together the capital cost and then the complexities involved in putting together the revenue estimate, right. O and M estimates, cost elements, all of you understand what O and M is, right. Now, we come to the from the gross which is revenue, we come to the net which is net of O and M costs which includes cost elements of power, fuel, labor, minor maintenance, major maintenance, responsive maintenance, insurance, industry benchmark, service level agreements, Six Sigma, all of you know what Six Sigma is right. Anything that is that you are doing it repetitive, you can achieve a level where it comes to 99 point x percent of predictability, sustainability and actual occurrence in house for expertise, supervision, outsourcing, manpower etcetera. Then you do the sensitivities, you do the sensitivities for market, revenues, capital cost, O and M, capital structuring, break even and the walk away. Tell me one thing, uh, let us talk a, a minute or two on walk away. If the competition is getting very, very tight right in the sense that uh, every bid sees 5 players, 6 players and you lose the bid and you find that your numbers you have gone over it thoroughly, you have estimated capital cost thoroughly, you have estimated revenues thoroughly, you have estimated O and M thoroughly, you have taken the best interest cost into account and you lose the bid right and then there is a next bid coming up. Would you be inclined to be aggressive enough to win that at any cost? Sorry? You should not do that. Any reason why you should do it? Agreed, you should not do it, I fully agree. Any reason why you could do it or should do it? Sorry? If you are a new player and you make a mistake, you want to commit harakiri. Okay, fine, agreed. Any Anything else? Ah, you have to stay relevant. You have to stay relevant. Otherwise, who is going to work with you? and big players can fail, right. So, uh, but I fully agree with you to start with and that is to walk away and wait till the market becomes more sensible, right. Provided how do you judge whether what you have done is right. You could be in this illusion that I am the best, whatever I am doing is right and whatever the other guy is doing he will go kill himself and willy nilly he actually survives and you just missed an opportunity in optimizing your own working. So, there is something called a loss tender analysis, right. 
very very important to do a loss tender analysis very objectively throw your books open to an outsider and say hey look tell me what i where have i gone wrong why is it that i am not competitive enough and get the best in the industry to look at it right so bid strategy i i don't want to get into all this uh, very quickly i think experiences and learnings so some of the things that i went that went wrong is more important for a discussion of this type forget about what went right we went wrong on our revenue estimates because of competitive pressures right wpi i explained to you technology shift i explained to you willingness to pay see most of infrastructure projects the public has to pay and if there is a law and order situation and you lose revenues for 3 months 4 months 6 months your project becomes less and less and less valuable so to assess the willingness to pay and to get the political sentiment around it is extremely important law and order support hinterland economy alternate routes front availability etc you know a lot has been spoken and written about land acquisition and right of way availability i don't want to get into that i think you would have been reading it in every way partly island fss problems are that as well that they could not finish their projects on time because the front was not available for construction for various reasons right either approvals were not there acquisition not completed demolition didn't happen utility could not be shifted you name it similarly on real estate underestimated market reactions to restrictive clauses in certain agreements and also lack of a quick response to market changes uh metro dealing with changing see infrastructure and politics are two sides of the same coin so you better figure out without paying bribes of course you better figure out how to deal with a politician if you want to be in infrastructure and if you want to remain clean right and believe me there is a way it's not that all is lost and if you don't carry sacks of money which in any case you can't do these days uh, sacks of money you know uh, nothing will happen at the same time i don't i i i i tend to agree with you that there is a lot of crony capitalism that goes around infrastructure unfortunately but you can make make your stand clear which is why i put it as one of the first things you have to choose as an employee you need to choose as to which kind of infrastructure organization you want to work for right so dealing with political situation underestimation in obtaining difficult stretches which is capital cost estimation schedule time dealing with transition to a new legislation development of real estate change of scope etc so i'll take just two more minutes if it's if it's okay with you how do you monitor a project we discussed so many aspects right we discussed aspects of project cost building we discussed aspects of revenue we discussed aspects of interest we looked at rfq processes rfp processes monitoring the financial health of a project is extremely important these are some of the issues that are there and uh, <coughs> if there are certain aspects where the government has to give you like for example land and they don't give it to you for a year or two years would you like to walk away agreements are clear you can walk away if you want to but then you have to face the philip side of termination litigation all that stuff but in in our opinion and experience it's you have to have a threshold right and that threshold is i'm going to wait for 6 months i'm going to wait for 3 months or 8 months make it clear to the government up front and they don't give it to you say thank you very much and just walk away so your calibration of how much money that you have to commit till you reach that threshold you have to take a calculated view if you pour in a lot of money and then it becomes a no go situation and you are stuck between the devil and the deep sea there you have to be very careful value drivers is similar we have discussed this that's about it thank you